Hey team, um, this is a review of the book Collaborative Leadership, Six Influences That Matter Most. It's authored by Peter um, M. DeWitt, published by, in 2017 by Corwin. This one comes recommended from our um, member Cam. Um, Cam McKay did a presentation with us much earlier um, in the year and around July and July, August, and really talked to us about some of the deep learning that had gone on in terms of leadership development as he was studying in Melbourne there. Um, this is a really useful book, a really useful book. This book brings much of the thinking of our current leadership thinkers and authors and influencers, you know, um, Sinek, Brene Brown, Lin Chioni, Sharma, Daisley, all into alignment with an education lens backed up by data, statistics, and synced to the meta-education thinking of Hattie and Vivian Robinson. It grows theories and ideals of leadership based in valuing people, their ideas, their diversity, and teams that work towards a cause. Collaborative leadership brings a descriptor to an inclusive, growth-focused leadership style. DeWitt presents this in a way of leading that values people and puts a relentless focus on learning. In writing this, this book is supported by some really big players. The foreword is written by John Hattie and the afterword by Russell um, Quagla. Peter DeWitt, after authoring this, has just released Collective Leadership Efficacy 2022 published date actually, um, published again by Corwin. The forward in this book is written by another big player, Michael Fullen. So in short, Peter DeWitt's thinking and work is backed by some pretty big um, players and well-recognised names in educational leadership. Perhaps his work is really worth listening to. He presents a relentless focus on efficacy in teaching and genuine collaborative cultures. He looks at positive school climates and impactful leadership teams. This is more than visible learning and visible teaching. It's more than visible leadership. He pushes it to a new level. Collaborative leadership. It is deep and hard practice. This, this book removes assumptions that we have about impactful leadership and reaches into data. It's more than instructional leadership and more than transformational leadership. Collaborative leadership has a relentless focus on learning. It is a leadership model that insists on everyone having a role, where titles don't impose on the way that a team works. The best person is called to lead at the right time. With collaborative leadership, genuine cultures um, that are authentic and with authentic practice exist. Cultures of trial and error, making mistakes and learning are valued. Teams where everyone has a voice and the leaders don't assume. Teams of shared vision, shared ownership and genuine partnerships. Growth is built from strengths. Inquiry jumps from an appreciative inquiry lens, building from the positive. Collaborative communities listen as much as they plan and leaders allow others to do the talking and everyone has a role in the doing. Decisions are deliberate, planned, purposeful, impactful and shared. DeWitt asks a critical question from the start. What do you want to be to leadership? And it took me a few times of reading that to really get what that meant. What do you want to be to leadership? What kind of leader do you want to be? What impact do you want to make? Well, the next six chapters in his book give us six key elements critical to collaborative leadership. Each chapter pulls the trait apart with the same format. Thinking, you know, exploring thinking, what does the data say? What evidence have you got to back this up? And then there's a discussion that goes through the chapter around the learning challenges that appear, and then it's followed by some examples in practice. And then each chapter ends with three action steps. Meet, like meet people and talk about this. Model, when you're out doing things, model, and then work to motivate and to build that momentum. So. Everything in practice is about meeting with people, modelling in my work, and then building the lead, building the, the eff, putting the effort in to motivate people. And then he breaks it down into these six chapters. So leadership 
instructional leadership, and we know little bits about that, but it has a 0 0.42 impact. So 0 0.4 is a year's growth on students. So 0 0.42, instructional leadership has a little bit more of an impact. And so he explores that one a little bit. These numbers are the effect size, John Hattie's research. Okay, but then if you jump to chapter two, collective, collective teacher efficacy, we can make so much. Look at that, that's, you know, do my math, but nearly four times the impact in a year if we build teachers' capacity. And then if we look at the assessment capable learner, so teachers that understand assessment and students that drive their own assessment, we're almost hitting the same rate. So what it's telling us is if we lead in a way that builds teachers' capacity and students' assessment ability and the ability to drive their own learning, look at the impact we can make. Add in some quality professional development and then look at feedback. And we're talking about feedback to teachers here, not students. You can make nearly two years difference by giving feedback to teachers that is quality. And that was my favourite chapter, a really, really interesting chapter. And then we look at family engagement. Do what pulls apart each of these impacts and builds a picture of collaborative leadership. He presents a table on how different leaders work. You know, um, negotiators, bystanders, regulate, regulators, and collaborators. Collaboration is that perfect balance between inspiring stakeholders and co constructing goals. But if you look at that, collaboration has high partnership and high performance. Um, we've got those that regulate that have like high performance but low partnership, and that can, in some cases, become a tipping point. So let's jump into this. DeWitt gives us some worthy quotes and ideas to hang on to, and I've summarised these first before we go chapter by chapter. Every decision, every action, does it have an impact on learning? Build leadership that relies more on each member and the team as a whole, rather than the leader. Motivate people to be their best every day. Let us talk about change. But let's start talking about improving. And that's that real connection to Vivian Robinson's work. Leaders reflect on their practice, their impact. Collaborative leaders, well, what do they do? They use evidence to reflect. They foster a positive school climate by being really positive themselves. They take a breath before reacting. They listen more and talk less. They bring people together with common bonds and a common focus, a common goal. And they themselves choose leadership for good reasons and stay for good reasons. There's an area of ethics there. More questions would come all of this though. Are you a do as I do or a do as I say leader? Do you go beyond numerical data to evidence and understand impact? Do you lead in front or side by side? There's a lovely little quote here by Simon Sinek. The role of the leader is not to come up with all the great ideas. The role of the leader is to create an environment in which great ideas happen. Vivian Robinson's leadership work is also quoted in here and comes back to um, in alignment with Hattie's effect size in his meta-analysis. And that's the impact that leadership has on learning and exploring other things. So with a principal participating in professional learning. Professional learning impact jumps from that earlier rate of 5.51 to 0.84. Establishing goals and expectations, which is what our leaders do, that gives us a 0.42 impact, so yeah, it makes a difference. Planning, coordinating and evaluating teaching in the curriculum, well that's 0.47. And aligning resources and priority teaching goals, 0.31. And ensuring that orderly environment, well that's 0.27, so it makes very little impact actually. However, all this does is so says, well, there are five key areas here that we look as leadership, key leadership jobs that as leaders we, we undertake and we do. They don't necessarily align with what DeWitt says makes that massive impact. However, it seems to be these are the things that we spend our time on and not necessarily that participating in teacher development where we can make our greatest impact. 
So we spend a whole lot of time doing stuff that's important but doesn't necessarily make the biggest impact. So are we spending our time wisely? And that's a really big thought as you explore into the next chapters. So number one, we've got instructional leadership, point four two. And that's coming from Hattie's work there. Too many leaders focus on curriculum coverage and number crunching. We need to change our mindsets to think more about learning, how we learn, how we enable learning, and how we can all make a greater impact. And Hattie's 10 mind frames of learning are offered here. What everyone presents is that collaborative leadership has a positive impact on learning. So there's some little questions and some little probes here that we really need to think about. Hattie's mind frame is there, you know, as a teacher or as a leader, I'm an evaluator, I'm a change agent. I talk about learning, not about teachers and not about teaching. As a leader, I see assessment as feedback to me and my impact and what other things I need to do differently. Jump to that article, Teaching Smart People How to Learn and look at yourself and the impact of yourself first. I engage in dialogue, not a monologue. I enjoy a challenge. I engage in positive relationships. I use the language of learning and I see learning as hard work and collaboration is important to me. We know it has that positive effect. So those critical questions and those reflective probes that I really want us to have a wee think about that jump out of chapter, this chapter, chapter one around instructional leadership. Do leaders build dialogue with staff that focuses on what works in the classroom and what doesn't? And that's a projection towards efficacy. Teacher talk versus student talk, that balance in the classroom, you know, he who talks learns. We're talking nine minutes and 45 for the teacher. And the politics of distraction. We are so distracted by management, by problems, by deficits, by listening to the I can'ts. And it's distracting us all from learning. Flip the focus back to learning. How variable is practice within your school? We keep comparing ourselves with everybody else, but look at your school first and the quality and levels and consistency of teaching and learning before measuring against others. And FYI, students spend 50% of their time doing things that they already know. And so much of that is on surface level features and surface features of learning. The roles of teachers and leaders is changing. We are being pushed to know thy learner and know thy data beyond numbers. Unsupportive and hostile school climates exist where risk taking can take a back seat to rule following. They focus on compliance. Leadership and teaching are about risk taking and rule following. We need both, it takes a balance, but have we got the balance right? Principles. What interaction do you have with learners? Do you talk about learning and learners? If not, the question is, what are you distracted by? So if we know our work has to be about teaching and learning, let's jump into the one that has the greatest impact and that often as leaders we know the least about, collective, collective teacher efficacy. The greatest influence on student progress and learning is having expert, inspired, passionate teachers and school leaders. So collective teacher efficacy, this is about to be effective, teachers need to be motivated and is your school climate empowering? Am I encouraged to openly communicate to be excellent? Is it inclusive and supportive? School climate has a profound impact on students' mental health. To be effective, we need to build that motivation. The school climate is the plate that everything lies on. And so if we haven't got that strong, positive school climate that talks about learning, what impact can we make? Efficacy, do we know what it is? Do we know about how to teach our teachers to be effective, about what actually works and why? And do they have the belief and know, know that when they go into that classroom, they're going to be great? You know, efficacy, how do you build it? How do you examine that practice? How do you build efficacy in your team? Do you understand what it is? Are you able to build a climate where everyone knows how to be effective and why 
this impact happens. And then go beyond believing that they are excellent to knowing that they are, knowing deeply that they are going to impact positively on learning. The third chapter jumps into assessment capable learners. And that has a 1.44 impact. We're talking self-regulated learners. And there's a real correlation here. Teachers who believe in themselves achieve success. And likewise, students who believe in themselves achieve success. Really reflect on that for a minute. Students have the biggest impact on their own learning. They must assess their own learning, take risks and know what to do when they don't know what to do so they don't get stuck. They know where they are going and how to get there and where to go next. Leaders, are you creating a culture to do this? Do teachers and students have the freedom to try new ideas? Do students know their data? I'm talking no secrets. Do students have a voice about how they learn and how the teacher impacts on their learning? You know, stop regulating and negotiating as much as you collaborate. Collaboration comes first. That's where you're going to make the greatest impact. But it's hard. Are you up for it? Are you able to give away some of that control and become a facilitator, just as we're asking teachers to become the facilitator in the classroom? Professional development. School leaders and teachers need to create schools and staff room and classroom environments in which error is welcomed as a learning opportunity. Many people say it, but few live it. Are you co-constructing with teachers to meet needs? Ask the team in designing your professional learning together. Is the focus of your professional learning on student learning? And is it building efficacy? Has leadership, you know, effective professional learning has leadership presence and participation. I mean the leader participating, showing value of the learning, creating a culture of learning and this builds the leader's credibility and provides opportunities for learning conversations. Does your professional learning use a range of modes and models and does it involve instructional coaching and do do your leaders know how to coach? collaborative inquiry over time and just FYI note one day courses don't impact and don't work the impact is minimal and that idea if we have flipped classrooms and doing the learning outside of and before we come to a meeting and then using meetings to really debate and dissect and discuss and focus on deep learning have you thought about that for your staff meetings your faculty meetings remember that learning is not always pleasurable and easy And that includes professional learning. Everyone needs professional learning to get us there. Is everyone being professionally developed? Stop taking professional learnings and making them into meetings. Meetings that list are a list of tasks or jobs to do. Start talking about learning. Effective collaboration is built on listening and learning. Collaboration is not a passive activity. So let's jump to our final page. Feedback. 0.75, and for me, this is the best chapter. Maybe because we're in the middle of an observation cycle or something. But teacher feedback, that's it. Useful feedback is more difficult to provide than most of us think. Feedback is really complicated, and there is a massive gap. The greatest learning in this chapter is the gap that exists between teachers and leaders' understanding and the value of the feedback that leaders give to teachers. Feedback should be about moving learning forward, but most of the time it just doesn't. So the questions I have that really made me sit up and think. Do you tell and make statements in your feedback or do you ask questions and discuss? Who talks the most and who of the people you're feeding back to needs to be told and who needs the dialogue and who needs questions? Because that's a differentiated approach and there are different teachers with different needs. Before you go in to do a formal observation or a performance management review, do you set personal goals? And if you don't have a goal or a purpose, then how do you give feedback? 
And how do you know what you're looking for? Who sets that goal and who knows the goal? Who values the goal? Or is it a preset criteria? Is co-construction a part of this process? And then feedback is more about words and more about the words and the conversations, more than the words and the conversations or a written statement. It's also about the way that you react, your interaction, your body language, and the processes and systems that you have, and the support and the dialogue and the discussion and the impact afterwards. So observations is, is a big part of the education community, but why do we do them? What is the purpose? And according to who? And this is a really big and interesting chapter. Teachers, do you see anything beneficial? And like, what is the purpose of an, an observation? And the feedback in the book tells us that teachers are saying, I'm over, I'm over observed. They always find something wrong. Do they really know what they're looking for? Uh, that's credibility. Uh, caught you, caught you doing something wrong. My principal has already made her mind up before she comes to see me. And feedback, well, am I going to believe what they're saying? And, you know, mostly nothing changes after it anyway because I don't get the support. And the gap is real because leaders bring a completely different perspective. They see observations as really important to growth for teachers. That feedback is beneficial, it's useful, and teachers value it, and it's really important. Sadly, it's really focused on student learning, and 80% of teachers see the feedback that their leaders give them as ineffective. Principals and teachers are often unskilled and untrained in giving feedback. Another question, loads of questions came to me from this book. Do observations really result in new learning or improving performance? Have you measured the impact? If feedback can have an effect size of 0.75, maybe, as leaders, we should get a whole lot sharper at this. And then finally, family engagement, 0.49. Now, this isn't something that we can um, overlook, but too many educators believe that family engagement is about ensuring that parents support and do what the school wants. And I love the way DeWitt challenges us with this. Because actually, what place do parents have in your building? Can they enter the building? What access do they have to teachers and learning? What voice do they have in making the school work? And why is school a secret? Hey, that's the second secret we're talking about. Secret for data to, for students and our secret with parents. And why, this is my one, why do we fear what parents have to say? I know as a young leader, I did. What assumptions do you make about your community? Do you think you know, but you don't really know? Do you involve parents in the brainstorming of new ideas and things before you begin? Are you actually aware of parent expectations? How do you know? Do you have dialogue pathways, not reporting pathways? Are there things that you, can, you are doing or encouraging that actually stop parents from engaging? Do you value parent diversity or is conformity from parents more important? Stop thinking about parental involvement and start thinking about moving towards family engagement. Families deserve to know and to be involved. And FYI, another one of these, 85% of school reports are fables or simply a PR exercise. So are you being authentic in your actions and intentions? How can technology help you to open up and flip parent and family engagement? Opening up the building. And DeWitt says, please, please get rid of your five-page newsletter and start to connect Collaborative leadership is about welcoming families into school, even if they may, they may be there to tell the principal something that they don't want to hear. What stops your school from connecting? Is it confidence or control? Are you scared? So now what? The last chapter, the chapter of action. So some gorgeous ideas and, and supports here. Start with the strengths. Appreciate these. Use these to inquire and to learn. 
When leadership focuses on the strengths of its employees, the odds of leadership employee rise around 73%, as opposed to 9% when you don't. Lose the deficit mindset. Start to think, why might, why might this work? Collaborative leadership puts everything out in the open. It's not for the faint-hearted. And remember, when we make changes and improvements, it often feels worse before it feels better. And there will be performance and implementation dips. They're real. We know that sigmoid curve. You've got to start the next change before you start to dip, and you'll dip anyway before you'll see improvement. Are you committed enough to making collaborative leadership the way you work? It takes a huge amount of time and understanding and resources and people. Are you committed enough to the cause, to the vision? There's a quote that I want to finish up with from page 185 from data. It's a data one. Leadership impacts. When school leaders are perceived as being willing to listen and to learn from their staff, that staff are three times more likely to work hard towards their goal. Well, that's pretty easy. We just need to listen and learn from our staff. That's a little bit of collaboration and we're going to get three times the performance. When school leaders take the time to really understand and appreciate their staff, they are six times more likely to be creative and then we have to allow them to take the risks and to be challenged and to, to make mistakes. But we want creative staff because that's going to create efficacy. And when teachers have a voice, they're four times more excited about their future in education. When they can have a say, they're going to stay with us a whole lot longer and do a high performing job. So my question, what's your pathway? There we go. That's that review. Peter DeWitt, a good one. Well worth putting on the bookshelf. Take care.